Complex numbers, matrices, and quantum mechanics. This is actually one of my favorite examples. And again, Chris Howells uh, referred to it. Here's one of the inventors of quantum mechanics, uh, Werner Heisenberg. Uh, he invented quantum mechanics when he was a very young man. Um, and he, uh, went, he, he could sort of write some complicated equations, and he didn't really understand those equations. So he went to his teacher, Max Born, who realized straight away that the equations Heisenberg had written down were simply the rules for manipulating matrices. Heisenberg was unaware of that, um, but once it was understood, it became absolutely obvious that matrices are absolutely quintessentially essential to uh, description of the real world if you want to describe quantum mechanics. If you want to know what goes on inside atoms, how the electrons move inside atoms, or how, what goes on inside the nuclei of, uh, of atoms, you absolutely need matrices. And you also need complex numbers. And this was realized by Erwin Schrodinger, one of the other great inventors of quantum mechanics. And here are their equations. This is the Schrodinger equation, which Chris Howells referred to. And it is an extraordinarily beautiful equation. And you see that the, what appears there is i, the square root of minus 1. And you can't get rid of it. You can't avoid the square root of minus 1 in quantum mechanics. You can avoid it anywhere else. But in quantum mechanics, it's absolutely essential. So I is part of the real world when you get down inside atoms or inside nuclei. The equations that Heisenberg wrote down were, were in this form. And you see he represented position, x, that's the position of a particle that's moving, an electron. And p, that's its momentum. Think of it as its velocity. And he, Heisenberg realized that a fundamental equation uh, of quantum mechanics came from saying that position times momentum is not the same as momentum times position. That would be true if these were regular numbers. 3 times 5 is 5 times 3. But in the real world, that's quantum mechanics, 3 times 5 isn't 5 times 3 if these represent position and momentum. In fact, the difference between position times momentum and momentum times position is proportional to the square root of minus 1. And I think that's exceptionally beautiful, that the square root of minus 1 appears in this essential way in the description of position and momentum of electrons. OK, well, these are some of my heroes. But one of my, one of my great, great, great heroes, and, and St Steve Coombs mentioned this earlier on, is Paul Dirac. And here's Paul Dirac. He, he was a British physicist. And there he is in the middle with Werner Heisenberg. And Dirac's one of the other great creators of quantum mechanics. And Dirac did a miraculous thing, something that still makes the hairs on the back of my neck stand up and gets me very excited. Because he wanted to put together relativity and quantum mechanics. And many people were trying to do this in the world, and they all had a tough time of it. And Dirac did a very radical thing. He said, I will guess how to marry quantum mechanics and relativity. And the way I'll guess is I'll simply write down the most beautiful equation that works. And this is his equation. Um, and I'm not going to tell you what the symbols are, but believe me, it's very beautiful. And Steve Coombs agrees with me. He thinks it's the most beautiful equation uh, there is. Uh, this is the Dirac equation. So Dirac guessed this equation purely based on the concept of mathematical beauty, not based on any experiments. He didn't, nobody came to him with new experiments and said, aha, this term has to be like this. He just guessed it because it was beautiful. And based on that guess, he was able to predict something. And that was the existence of antimatter. Now, the crucial things that appear in here, again, there's the square root of minus 1. And these things, these coefficients, alpha k, they're matrices. So you go straight from the beauty of matrices and complex numbers to be able to predict the existence of antimatter. And I think that's kind of remarkable. OK, another example. This is symmetry in the discovery of new laws. Uh, as I say, mathematicians became very adept at playing with symmetries, so adept they forgot that there were actually objects that might be symmetric, and they just played with the symmetries. And this is one of the great mathematicians um, of the last century, um, Emmy Noether, and she became uh, a very, very adept at developing the general mathematics of symmetry. And then other people took these ideas up, in particular, well, there are many of them, but Murray Gell-Mann and Abdus Salam, and this became one of the dominant themes of the 20th century, was that by taking these very general symmetries that mathematicians had written down, just for the hell of it, just because they were fun to play with, you could actually deduce new laws of nature. These are Emmy Noether's equations. Again, I won't tell you what the symbols mean. But the beauty is you can go from equations like this to predicting the existence of quarks, that is, the constituent elements of, uh, 
of nucleons, of protons and neutrons. So this is what Murray Gell-Mann did. He realized that there were some very abstract pure mathematics of symmetries, and he realized what the right abstract mathematics was, and from that he predicted the existence of quarks. No experiment was done to tell people what went on inside protons and neutrons. It was pure mathematics and guesswork that did it. Abdus Salam, very great hero of mine, um, he took some other generalized symmetries that Emi Neutra disco uh, discovered, and he applied them to physics, and he predicted how electromagnetism and the forces that exist inside individual nuclei uh, behave. And uh, both these, both these uh, Gelman and Salam, got Nobel Prizes for their work. But it was really based on just developing the mathematics of Emi Neutra. So, let me remind you what Wigner said about the role of mathematics and tell you how that fits in with the examples I've just given. The laws of nature, so I'm just repeating a slide I had earlier, just for sort of to summarize. Laws of nature are most naturally expressed in terms of mathematics. Well, I've given you the equations. I've not told you what the equations mean. I've not defined the symbols. But you see, they're very simple. I can write them on one transparency each. In the case of Einstein's equation, I could write it on the back of a postage stamp, or in the case of the Schrodinger equation. And yet they involve not simple mathematical concepts, but very profound mathematical concepts that people had invented earlier on just for the fun of it, but then later on you find out they appear as essential in the description of the natural world. So we need mathematics to work out the consequences of these laws. If you want to solve these equations, you've got to use very fancy mathematics. But the crucial thing is that to actually discover many of the laws of nature, one needed pure mathematical concepts. And it's uncanny how often this happens. This is the remarkable thing. Every time physicists go off and discover new phenomena, or many, many times, I shouldn't over-exaggerate, many, many times physicists go off and discover new phenomena that aren't described by the laws of nature that are known, they go off and they find bits of pure mathematics, and they find that that particular bit is just what's needed to give the right description of that property of the natural world. So this interplay between pure mathematics created by people for the fun of it and natural science, the description of the real world, this is what's uncanny. And this is what Wigner really wanted to uh, point out to people. And I repeat his quotation, it's difficult to avoid the impression that a miracle confronts us here. <laughs>